These are Nebraska corn farmers. They work in acres, not hours, harvesting the energy and climate solutions the world needs. We are proud to stand with you. The success of tomorrow's soy industry depends on the actions we take today. The future is here, and the time to move is now. Market Journal Television for Agricultural Business Decisions is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources in partnership with the Nebraska Rural Radio Association. Promotional support provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine and partial funding provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Hi everyone, I'm Bryce Duskit and thank you so much for joining us today on Market Journal. As always, we've got a lot of ground to cover on this week's episode. Extension educator Brad Lubin will be stopping by to share some helpful advice regarding ARC and PLC enrollment. And Rick Hunt will also drop in to give us the latest when it comes to weather. Plus, the annual Women in Ag event is right around the corner. We've got all the information that you need for this year's event. We'll get into those stories coming up here in a few moments, but first. We have some FSA updates I'd like to pass along with our local ag producers today. Last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Farm Service Agency began offering disaster assistance to Nebraska farmers and livestock producers who may have been impacted by the recent winter storms. Any affected producers are encouraged to contact their local county FSA office to learn about the programs and how to apply for assistance, including needing to understand the documentation, such as farm records, herd inventory receipts, and photos of damages or losses. Extreme recent cold and winter weather has been particularly challenging for livestock producers in the Cornhusker State. Some producers experienced losses or had other impacts. Producers who did experience livestock death due to winter storms may be eligible for the Livestock Indemnity Program. Meanwhile, the Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm Raised Fish Program may provide eligible producers with compensation for livestock and honeybee fee needs that have been above normal due to extreme winter weather. For LIP and ELAP, both require producers to file a notice of loss as well as an application for assistance. Documentation of livestock losses and other impacts is extremely important for both programs, and producers are encouraged to contact their local county FSA office as soon as possible for details on those documentation needs. Examples of documentation for livestock losses and establishment of beginning livestock inventory includes, but is not limited to, pictures of losses with a time and date stamp if possible, purchase records, production records, vaccine records, bank or other loan documents, or third-party certification. The Emergency Conservation Program can assist livestock owners and livestock producers with financial and technical assistance to restore damaged fence lines and remove snow from feedstocks, water supplies, and feeding areas. ECP implementation begins at the local level when conditions meet program requirements and the FSA County Committee requests and is approved for assistance. Like the above programs, documentation is also important for ECP assistance. Producers are encouraged to keep daily logs of snow removal efforts taken for feeding livestock during the severe winter weather as potential documentation in the event that ECP is implemented in their county. Eligible orchards or nursery tree growers may also be eligible for cost-sharing assistance for the tree assistance program to replant or rehabilitate eligible trees, brushes, or vines lost during the winter storms. A program application must be filed within 90 days of the disaster event or the date when the losses become apparent. For additional information on these programs, you can find that by visiting farmers.gov and utilizing the many tools available online at the website, all of which can help producers as well as landowners determine other programs or loan options. Moving along now, it is that time of the year already. You're encouraged to save the date for February 22nd through the 23rd in order to attend this year's Nebraska Women in Agriculture Conference, once again taking place in Kearney. This conference will focus on the five areas of agricultural risk management, which are production, market, financial, human, and legal risk. Market Journal's Bill Dodd is standing by now with more details on this year's event. Bill? Thanks, Bryce. 
It is indeed that time of year again. The 39th annual Women in Ag Conference will be held from February 22nd through the 23rd at the Holiday Inn Convention Center in Kearney, Nebraska. Now this event will feature a wide variety of over 20 workshops and words of wisdom from multiple keynote speakers. This annual conference will bring producers together with experts from a wide variety of agricultural disciplines that will leave attendees feeling empowered, enlightened, and connected to each other and their respective operations. While the event kicks off in earnest on February 22nd, conference attendees who may have previously wondered what entity is best for their farm or ranching operations will have an option to attend a pre-conference workshop on business entity selection on February 21st. So we're really excited to be back in Kearney February 22nd and 23rd. And actually, we actually start on the 21st with a pre-conference event that's very exciting. And we're going to be talking about entity selection for farms and ranches. So we'll have an awesome attorney, Katie Samples-Dean, as well as a CPA, working together to talk about the pros and cons of each type of entity. Of course, then we kick off our regular event on Thursday and Friday, and we'll start with Dr. David Cole, who is a renowned economist who's going to be talking about the current market conditions, and we'll also be featuring Ashley Machado, a mental health specialist who specifically works in agriculture from California. The Nebraska Women in Agriculture event, I think, is pretty unique in the state of Nebraska. Um, we feature five general session speakers and over 25 workshops. So regardless of what aspect of the industry that you're involved in, we've got something for you. So whether you're a new and beginning producer or whether you're a non-operating landowner, you can find something uh, that you can work on and the skills that you can build through our event. If you're planning on attending this year's conference, now is the time to book your rooms and a spot at the event. Booking early will earn you a discounted rate to attend the conference, and there's only a limited time left to catch the early enrollment window. Yep, so again, we do have a hotel block that will expire um, here at the end of January, um, but even if that hotel block has expired, you'll still have access to the many hotels that are in the region. So if you register with us before February 7th, there is a discounted rate. That rate does go up on February 8th, and you can find all of that information on our website, wia.unl.edu. So to recap, the Nebraska Women in Ag Conference will be held at the Holiday Inn Convention Center in Kearney, Nebraska from February 22nd through the 23rd, with a special pre-conference kickoff event happening on the 21st if you would like to arrive early. Early bird registration is available until February 7th with the full conference price of $150 and a one-day charge of $90. The full conference registration price will increase to $175. Also, if you have a guest that you would like to bring along for lunch, that can also be arranged for a $25 charge as well. Of course, life does get in the way sometimes, and if you have to cancel for any reason, you will receive a full refund of your registration fee if you cancel by February 18th or receive a 50% refund if canceled by February 20th. In short, this event is going to be a great opportunity for participants to learn how to better manage risk, improve their farms and ranches, as well as learning to further boost their success as operators and business partners. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the event and how you can attend, you're encouraged to visit the Women in Ag homepage at wia.unl.edu. Bryce, we'll send it back to you. All right, Bill, thank you very much for that information. We appreciate it. Sounds like another great event on tap. Let's focus our attention now over to the grain markets. Joining the show this week is Jeff Peterson. He's the president of Heartland Farm Partners. Here's our conversation. Let's talk about the markets as you see them. Kind of here in January, we will be a little bit retrospective too and talk about the markets since we harvested them in the fields. How do you see things? You know, as we sit back and look at this past year, it, it really was a hard year of marketing for everybody. We ended up having in many parts of a the area that's listening and, and watching us, you know, it was an area that the crops were off and there was that big fear of missing out uh, on the production side and that kept a lot of people from selling. And, and then you look at the markets and the whole hope with all that is that that would have given us some higher markets, but boy, it sure didn't. So if we kind of go back to look at where things were at back at harvest, you know, we did get a little bit of a rally up to the middle of October in, in corn. It sure felt like that was going to kind of get legs and keep going, but it didn't. It rolled over and started pulling back. And the same thing on beans. We had a run up that happened, you know, latter part of October into November, kind of peaks up around that $14 area as we were coming into the middle of November, but then it rolled over. And, and what's really strange about all that is I, we are surprised that we did end up seeing those markets go farther. The reason we're surprised, if we sit back and look, what was driving a lot of that at that time was the uncertainty about South American weather 
and the speculative traders were buying into that a little bit, but they didn't buy into it very much. And that weather, if you think about it, that September through December time frame, what was setting that stage in there, that was the hottest, driest time that we ended up having in Brazil. And it had an impact on the crop, but it just didn't get that market to run very far. And then really what happened is once the speculative traders rolled over and started selling the beans, we've just kind of had a, a steady move down. Now we've had a little bounce here lately, but it just forced that market down and corn followed along with it. I want to expand a little bit what you're talking about. Obviously, the funds play a big role in all of this as we talk about the futures market. How have you seen them play a big role over the past month or two? Yeah, they definitely play a big role. And what happens, it kind of becomes about, you'll hear people talk about money flow. And really what that means is that you just got traders that are, that are physically either selling bushels or buying bushels. And we've seen both happen since harvest. On the, on the corn side, we've continued to see the funds, you know, get shorter and shorter the market. Uh, so, for instance, you know, every Friday the Commitment of Traders report comes out and that reports what the fund position as is of the previous Tuesday. And, and right now, rounding off, they're roughly short about 1.3 billion bushels of corn. That's a, a good position. That's a big position. It's a record position short for this time of year. It's probably the third shortest they've been over the last, call it, 10 years. Over on the beans, though, we saw them shift their position. They were buying into the weather problems that was happening in South America. They got up to where they were long about 40,000 contracts, so a couple hundred million bushels. But then they started selling off long before that market rolled over, and they continued to sell off. And they didn't stop at zero. What they did is they continued to pile into that position. And now they have, you know, a, not a record short position, but they're get, building on that right now, Bryce. Saw somebody online when asked about what are the funds going to do? Someone responded and said, well, the funds, they're going to make money. That's what they want to do. And as a farmer, you're going to be long as long as you are uh, planting a crop every single year. Is that a fair way to put things? Yeah, it is a fair way. And, and what we have to think about is that we always talk about that manage money. So they're going to buy or sell and they're trend followers. And basically, if they get on a trend, they're going to continue on that trend until they see something fundamentally or technically or both that causes that to change. Now, on the other side, we don't talk about the index funds very often, but they're definitely out there. And the index funds are a, a long only. They buy it, and at some point, they have to sell it. Usually, it's used as a hedge against inflation. But, but we've seen them get out a lot of their positions, and they've pulled back in that. And that, that also puts some pressure on the market also, Bryce. Okay. So we look at what's happening this week. A little bit of a turnaround. A viewer question came in asking, have we seen the bottom for corn and soybean markets right now? Well, as we dig in and look at that market, you know, we've definitely seen some positive signs. So let's go back and take a look. You know, last Thursday for both corn and soybeans, market did go lower, couldn't continue to go there and did reverse and start coming back up um, higher. What was interesting is that we don't see this on a daily chart, but if we were physically looking at basically a continuous chart, that would basically show each day of trade and whatever the most current month is, nearby month is for us. And we are looking at on a weekly basis, we actually just came into some very strong technical areas uh, in there. And, and, and it looks like we did find some support in those areas. Now the market has bounced up higher here so far, but what's lacking right now is we aren't necessarily seeing anything from the news side that's gonna fuel it yet. So it appears from price action that we have found a bottom, but we are gonna have additional have to have additional information to continue to move this market higher. What could that information look like? South America weather perhaps? Yeah, so as we dig into that, South America weather at this current time is actually, you know, it's actually probably hurting us a little bit on the bean side. So keep in mind, the market peaked when it looked like the, actually the weather was actually probably at some of the worst, uh, but yet that was a point just prior to where it started to change. And, and we haven't seen the lowest numbers yet by no means out of USDA on crop size. They're, they'll continue to get smaller. But I think really probably the story that could actually give probably me more support to the market down the road, Bryce, actually could be so that safrina corn. And, and not only safrina corn from the overall production, but it is two-sided there. You're gonna end up having the acre side, and there's a lot of discussion out there that could be 5% less acres, could be up to 25% less acres of safrina corn. Now keep in mind, that safrina corn crop normally makes up 75 to 78% of all their corn production. And so it does look like there's gonna be less acres. Now the, how much, that's gonna have a big impact on the market. As we dig into that deeper, the reason becomes, well, why is that happening? Well, it's because of profitability. 
and we're going to have to watch very closely if that materializes. The other side of that discussion that has to unfold yet would be the yield side. And the yield side, the so concerning part about that, really gets back to, you know, what what are they going to get that timing of the planting of that crop and then what's the weather going to be as it gets into the pollination and early ear fill stage which happens out in April. Good stuff there with Jeff. Sure appreciate him joining us here on the show. Now coming up next week we will be joining you from a special event. I want to invite you to join us for a deep dive into the cattle markets. Join us uh, next week on Market Journal. Water is often scarce these days, even for an irrigation state such as Nebraska that sits on a gigantic aquifer. Irrigators in many parts of the state have already been under groundwater allocations for quite some time now. While limitations in those allocations are not ideal at times, most producers in those areas do understand the restrictions are necessary to preserve groundwater resources for everyone, which includes the next generation of farmers. You can learn more about living with water limitations in the January issue of the Nebraska Farmer. What well, is now time to talk weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Eric Hunt. Eric finally saw some temperatures get above freezing this week. What can we look forward to in the week ahead? Well, thanks, Bryce. We haven't had a chance to thaw this week, and next week looks even nicer. Matter of fact, we have no blizzards, no windchill warnings, or no fog in the forecast for next week. That's really, really good news considering what we've had the last two or three weeks. We should have a lot more sunshine next week, which is another bonus, and we are going to stay dry through Friday. WPC shows no precipitation over the entire state of Nebraska through next Thursday, and that should stay that way through Friday. We will be under the presence of upper-level ridging most of next week, and with that, we will have warmer temperatures. As a matter of fact, there's a chance right now that we could be in the 50s on Wednesday and Thursday. Some spots near the Kansas border may even push 60 next Wednesday. Unfortunately, this isn't going to last forever. We are starting to probably head back to more active periods. So in the last week or so, we've seen the equatorward shift in the, polar, in the Pacific jet stream. We're starting to see it extend, which generally means wetter, wetter weather for the western U.S., including California. And as we head into early, uh, late next week, so next week, and we're starting to see a sharp trough move into the western U.S., and I think we're going to start seeing some active weather from that by next Saturday, maybe even next Sunday. Details at this point are still fuzzy, but if I would pay attention to this, this could be a pretty big storm. Uh, snow would be possible in western Nebraska. Again, the CPC uh, is relatively bullish on the entire western two-thirds of the country being wetter than average uh, through the first week of February. So again, I think this is mainly focused on that storm probably coming in next weekend. Uh, generally very warm uh, for most of the next week. Again, I think this will be probably more front-loaded than back-loaded, probably be heading to more just slightly above seasonal temperatures as we head into the first week of February. Uh, I don't have the latest drop monitor report since this is Wednesday. I'm filming this, not Thursday. But I just want to show what we have seen changes across the continent of the United States in the last uh, three months or so. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of positive changes uh, across the U.S., including ac across most of Nebraska. Uh, precipitation the last seven days, uh, at a clipper moved through last Thursday night before that last blast of Arctic air, and we did have a couple of snow squall warnings, which is really fun to walk out in. Um, precipitation values are relatively light, uh, generally on the order of a two tenths of an inch or less. Most of western Nebraska got left out again. Uh, soil temperature is generally below freezing uh, under four inches, uh, I'm sorry, at four inches under grass cover. In western Nebraska, where we've had less snow cover. In the eastern side of the state, where we have more snow cover, we, our soil temperatures are generally kind of right around the freezing mark, give or take a little bit. Soil moisture across the state, generally speaking, is about where it has been for most of the last couple of months, uh, still kind of gradually improving. Definitely seen some more improvement in the eastern third of the state in the last month or so with general precipitation. And we're just definitely improving here across the central and eastern Corn Belt. Snow cover again, generally a lot of snow cover, uh, eastern half Nebraska and Iowa and Wisconsin, and Illinois, lower snow cover in the north, northern plains. And I hate to say, we are definitely kind of behind on snow cover in the northern Rockies and those basins are generally behind where they normally would be for snow water equivalent. Uh, another issue that could be, I wanna bring up is uh, that recent cold that we had about uh, say a week, week and a half ago, uh, you know, well below zero, almost 20 below zero. And some spots you know, where we have a lot of winter wheat, uh, we did see, um, you know, temperatures dropping down almost 20 below uh, with not a whole lot of snow cover. So I may be interested to see uh, what happens with some of the winter wheat in that area. Thanks and back to you, Bryce. Thank you very much for that update, Eric. Nebraska's USDA Farm Service Agency is reminding ag producers that now is the time to make election or enroll in the agriculture risk coverage and price loss coverage programs for the 2024 crop year. Those programs, also known as ARC and PLC and producers, have until March 15th to make their selection. Joining the show this week to discuss those programs was Extension Educator Brad Lupin. 
And Brad, really what we're talking about is the economics have changed here in 2024 when it comes to having to make decisions for crop insurance. Kind of set mm -hmm. up the situation as you see it. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, it's the same decision producers have had for the last several years with a simple extension of the 18 Farm Bill again for another year. It's the same program, ARC and PLC. But it is different economic conditions uh, with uh, prices ha that have moved higher over the last several years and now maybe coming off of those highs. We have a moving average that's gone higher which means that the ARC guarantee adjusts accordingly, but in fact, so does the PLC guarantee. Uh, PLC is a reference price, but there's an effective reference price formula. And in 2024, perhaps for the first time, for at least for the major crops, that moving average has moved high enough that the calculation of an effective reference price actually goes up. Take corn, for example. The effective reference price for corn for 2024 is 401, instead of the legislated reference price of 370. So a substantial move up. ARC, the, what I consider to be the effective price protection in ARC, uh, recognize, remember, there's a benchmark yield and a benchmark price times 86% gives you this guarantee. Uh, if you assume that's out of the price, so you're assuming benchmark yields, then the effective protection price for ARC is about 417. Well, 401 versus 417 is a lot closer than we've been between PLC and ARC uh, versus where we've been the last several years either way. With our time together today, I want to try to break down the two main programs we talk about, yep. agriculture risk coverage and price loss coverage. We'll start on ARC. Yeah. What does that cover exactly? So ARC, as it was originally created in 2014 and as it continues to date, it really is a fundamental revenue-based safety net but it's tied to a moving average revenue. I mentioned a benchmark yield times a benchmark price. This happens at the county level, or for those individuals that really want a farm level protection policy, ARC for the farm or ARC individual coverage ties all crops on the farm together. But most are thinking about ARC at the county level, uh, crop by crop. Uh, you have a county level yield, um, uh, Olympic average of a, of a trend adjusted county yield. You have a national marketing year price and you take a, uh, uh, an Olympic average of that. Uh, that produces a benchmark revenue. That's a, effectively, what's the revenue you would expect to receive, assuming everything's sort of an average result? Multiply that by 86%, that's the guarantee. ARC pays when the local county result falls below that guarantee. Now, ARC is not a full sort of deep loss protection safety net. It only pays the first 10% of losses from that 86% guarantee down to 76% of the, uh, of, the uh, of the benchmark. Uh, that helps producers on the more frequent sort of shallow losses in revenue. Uh, it doesn't help on the deepest losses, or at least it stops early on the deepest losses. And it's really up to a producer to remember the rest of their safety net, whether that's crop insurance or marketing or other risk management decisions. But ARC helps protect uh, the shallow losses that we often sort of argue happen too frequently. Okay, so that's ARC. How does it differ for PLC, yeah. price loss coverage? Price loss coverage really mimics the same price safety net that we've had for decades. And as it was designed and then modified in the 2018 Farm Bill, it protects producers when the national marketing year average price falls below the reference rate. Well, there's a legislated reference rate, which is effectively a minimum, but then there is a formula to move that reference rate higher if prices are higher. So you, again, look at uh, marketing your average prices over a, a his, over a recent five-year period. You take an Olympic average. Uh, if 85% of that Olympic average is higher than the legislated rate, you move the reference rate higher. So we have an effective reference rate that's higher than, than what was originally legislated. There is a cap on that, uh, always something to add complexity, 115% of the legislated reference rate. So corn is an example. The legislated reference rate in, in the 18 Farm Bill, the 14 Bill before it, was 370 a bushel. 115% of that, I believe, gets to 426. In between 370 and 426, if the effective reference price price is in there, that's the uh, that's where we're at. And for 2024, that's 401. So that's an example. 
we have an upcoming deadline. FSA has a March 15th deadline for right. sign up for uh, for this year. Talk about what that looks like. A producer heads right. into their county office. Well, it's the same decision that producers have had for several years. If you want to change your current enrollment, you need to make uh, a decision, an election at the FSA office, in addition to visiting the FSA office to make the annual uh, participation decision. Uh, given the complexity this year with prices moving, which means the guarantees are moving, which means the relative uh, benefits of ARC versus PLC may shift a bit for producers, it's worth analyzing and then going and making a, a thoughtful decision at FSA. It's not as simple as just keep me in what I was in. Uh, it's, it's worth the time to make a decision. It's worth some education uh, and some analysis to make a good decision. To that education point, you've got a webinar. We'll uh, post a link to that. You yeah. posted this past Thursday, but in February, in-person sessions as well. Talk about those. Right. Well, we're collaborating. As we have done annually, we're collaborating. Nebraska Extension and, and USDA Farm Service Agency here in Nebraska are collaborating on education for producers. That started with a webinar here in January uh, to uh, present a broad overview of uh, program and enrollment details along with economic analysis of that decision. We'll carry that same message out to 20 uh, meetings across the state in February. Uh, again, a, a Nebraska Extension, uh, Nebraska FSA collaboration. So on our CAP uh, website, our Center for Ag Profitability website, uh, cap.unl.edu, you'll find all this information. Um, but uh, certainly there's an opportunity uh, to, to do some uh, education for yourself, whether it's to watch a recording of the webinar uh, that we've completed or whether it's to uh, uh, find a meeting and, and come attend in person and listen to the discussion. Uh, you can certainly learn a little bit before you go into the FSA office. Always good to get Brad's thoughts on those items. Like I mentioned earlier, there are several Farm Bill workshops happening across the Cornhusker State that will cover both ARC and PLC coverage. If you'd like to attend one of those or get some additional information, you can visit the link at the bottom of your screen now. Well, that is all the time we have for this week's broadcast. Coming up next week, we, were gonna have, we are going to have some highlights from the 2023 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show happening in sunny Orlando. We'll also review this year's Eastern Nebraska Corn and Soybean Expo. Plus, learn how you can apply to be a candidate on the Nebraska Soybean Board. We hope to see you next time. But until then, I'm Bryce Duskit, wishing you a safe and productive week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.